So welcome back, welcome to everybody. So I'm continuing the um, uh, course. So we had a week break. So the first week I kind of explained a lot of background material and motivation and outline. So we are, let me recall you that we are studying um, smooth area preserving flows on surfaces. Uh, they're actually symplectic or uh, they are actually locally Hamiltonian flows. And uh, um, uh, I'm assuming that there are, I'm considering the generic case where this flow must have singularities. And I'm assuming that the singularities are uh, simple saddles or uh, um, uh, centers. And we are interested in the ergodic properties of these flows and especially uh, so far, I'm concentrating on the presence or absence of mixing, which is, um, and uh, this question, the, the genus one uh, 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 case was uh, considered by Arnold, who conjectured mixing in uh, locally Hamiltonian flows with one uh, saddle and one center on the torus. Uh, conjecture proven by Sinai and Hanning shortly after. And all the course we are trying, I'm trying to go into the proofs and the techniques to prove uh, the full classification in higher genus. And in higher genus, there is kind of a dichotomy. You have an open set where uh, no mixing is typical and an open set where on various minimal components, the flow is mixing. And we are trying to uh, describe this picture. And today I really want to go into the proofs We'll probably do mostly mixing today, but I will prepare some things for absence of mixing, which I'll finish on Thursday. So last class on uh, the first day, I just gave an overview and motivated this question and the picture. Um, last lecture, we were more concrete and we said we are going to give a very concrete representation of these flows, which is useful for the proofs. So let me recall you one proposition which we actually proved quite essentially in all details almost uh, last time. So I'm looking at a locally Hamiltonian smooth area preserving, it's equivalent, smooth area preserving flow with non-degenerate saddles and I look at a minimal component. So maybe I will make a digression before I comment on that. Let me, something which I didn't say the first time and maybe now it's a good moment to uh, 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 say it. So min let me write a minimal component decomposition. And this is a result which is quite old and it's due already to Meyer, Levit, independently. Meyer, Levit, also Anton Zorich has a, uh, maybe unpublished, I don't know. Uh, so if you have such a flow, so Fitti uh, can be decomposed into the following fundamental blocks, uh, into elliptic components. I'm going to give them this fancy name. But these are essentially, uh, yes? Sorry, Dietermeyer or do you remember the first name? Uh, Dieter could be. It's in the, this is a result from the, Quite old, 60s maybe even. Quite, it's very, yeah, quite, yeah. No, I'm not, yeah. So I, I, can, I can check later, but uh, elliptic components. This will be either islands with, have a center surrounded by uh, uh, closed orbits, disks essentially, disks filled by a center and closed orbits, or uh, cylinders filled by uh, closed orbits. So these are disks plus a center or a cylinder. <coughs> and the boundary of these elliptic components is indeed a saddle loop homologous to zero. So it will be so at the boundary of this disk, you will see this famous half figure eight. And similarly, in this case, at the boundary of your uh, 
cylinder, you will see uh, some cell connections. And typically, you will see these figure eights. This was what Arnold had already remarked. And uh, this may that by also disconnect your surface. So um, it could happen that your surface maybe has one of the cylinders. And uh, this cylinder will disconnect, could disconnect your surface into more uh, uh, parts. And uh, let's see. OK, maybe I'll put some extra genus here. And, uh, and up to G up to G, where G is the genus, minimal components. So the basic example we had uh, last week was Arnold flow, where you have one island, and uh, 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 in the typical case, a minimal component on the complement. And so what we are describing now are these minimal components. Okay. So in this minimal components is essentially a subsurface with boundary possibly where orbits are dense. And uh, the flow dynamics is trivial in these parts. So we are interested in the ergodic properties of the minimal blocks. And we have now, I go back here. So for each of these minimal components, I can represent it as a special flow. So we show that the Poincaré map on a co-dimension one section is an interval exchange transformation. And I can represent the flow as this picture of special flow, where uh, points move vertically up under some identification between F and the base. And uh, the function which appears in the special flow is nothing else than the return time. So how long it takes to a trajectory to come back to the section. So this return time explodes at the singularities. And uh, by a calculation on, log on Hamiltonian simple saddles, you can see that it blows up logarithmically. So it takes a logarithmic amount of time uh, to come back. Uh, logarithmic as a function of the distance. So this is the explicit form of the roof. And I take the chance to correct some typos that were in last uh, time. So someone correctly asked me, what's the definition of x plus? I don't know who was in the audience. Uh, so uh, indeed, so this function wants to take the positive part. So if this argument is positive, this is absolute value of log. If the positive function, the argument is 0 or negative, I want this to be 0. So I set it to be minus 1. So <laughs> it's minus one, so that the log, uh, sorry, one, uh, so that the log, uh, the log is uh, zero. So it's only, okay. I think I wrote zero, which of course is silly. I don't want infinity there. And uh, uh, there are two crucially different cases. So this is kind of the right side of the discontinuity. This is the left side of each discontinuity. And they each have a constant. And we proved last time that if, OK, so there are two cases. Uh, the singularities are called asymmetric. And we write asymmetric log. I will use this notation today. We say that the roof belongs to the class of asymmetric log of t. Uh, the dependence on t is only on the depend because the, discontinu the singularities coincide with the subset of the discontinuities of the interval exchange. <laughs> So they, they vary with the IT. And uh, uh, it's uh, asymmetric if the constants to the left add up to something different than the constants to the right. And th that is the case of the Arnold flow, where you have constant on one side and twice the same constant on the other. And uh, so every time you have set the loops, uh, homologous to 0, like in this case of Arnold, they produce some uh, asymmetry between the right and the left side. And typically, you will have, uh, 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 and maybe let's write phi t in this u, I don't remember. So you typically, so you have to uh, uh, be in an open dense set where there cannot be further cancellations that compensate for the asymmetry. And in the other case, uh, symmetric, uh, the constants are the same from right and left. 
And uh, this difference, I'm stressing it because today it will be crucial. And uh, let me recall you the philosophy that we want to prove uh, mixing for typical ITs when there is an asymmetry. And we want to prove absence of mixing for typical IT when there is a symmetry. So this will be our goal. And we will stay today in this language of suspension flows. And what I want to explain mostly today is how do you, what are these uh, conditions you need to put on the IT, on the interval exchange, which are some sort of diophantine conditions for interval exchanges. And today we will use Rosevich induction to explain these conditions. OK, so but I also spent some time last time to uh, describe heuristically what, what produces mixing, if there is mixing, and the f geometric phenomenon of shearing. So before we do Rosevich induction, let me write a formally criterion for mixing, a criterion for mixing, and a criterion for absence of mixing for uh, uh, some special flow like this, okay? Uh, so I already spent some time justifying this phenomenon that when there is a symmetry, there is a shearing, and shearing is quantified in terms of uh, Birkhoff sums. But uh, uh, okay, maybe the, the criterion is actually more elementary than this. So uh, you have a special flow. So, so if for any B rectangle, so this is my target rectangle, uh, there is partial partitions. So I want to find partitions of the, it's enough to do them for one slice. I can do it for the base partial partitions of 0, 1 uh, into intervals by partial partitions I mean a disjoint union of intervals that maybe doesn't fill fully so I can remove some part of space uh, some partial partitions uh, let me call them PT such that so the Lebesgue measure of Pt goes to, to 1. So they are partial, but they feel as time grows. Uh, and uh, the mesh, the shortest interval, so the la sorry, the largest interval goes to 0. So if you can cut the base into as many small intervals, that fill more and more of the space and uh, 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 size goes to zero. So the partition is tending to the trivial partition into points. And uh, uh, each of these intervals separately equidistributes. And uh, for every, let's call it J in the partition, so this would be a small interval. Every of this J, if I look at the Lebesgue measure of the points in J intersected with phi minus T of B, so these are points in J that after time T enter B. So you see the proportion of J which, uh, when I flow, will intersect my target rectangle. Uh, the Lebesgue measure of the sets uh, of this, uh, 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 well, I can write it like this, tends to uh, 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 J times the, ma the area. area. This is Lebesgue measure of J times the area of B. So each of them equidistributes. Then phi T is mixing. This is not very deep lemma. Uh, so essentially, I will only write one word for the proof. And this word is Fubini. Okay. 
So you can just prove this by Fubini argument. And this is what I said at the end of last lecture informally. If I have a target set A, I want to slice it into horizontal. Once I have a partition of the horizontal, you can flow it easily and kind of it's enough to prove it for the horizontal. I want to find many small intervals that independently equidistribute. Uh, uh, I think I need a new chop. One second. Uh, how do you, what do you want? Uh, uh, and basically, you can get mixing. So, this is key property that each interval uh, equidistributes. So, to prove star, what we will show is that uh, each interval becomes. Uh, uh, what we want to show, we said last time, is to show that each of these intervals shears and be 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 shadows a long trajectory of the flow. So the idea is that there is the shearing phenomenon when there is a symmetry, and horizontal intervals shear in the prevalent direction of the asymmetry and become almost linear and almost vertical. And uh, once they are almost linear and almost vertical, they are almost a trajectory of the flow. And the flow, if the base is uniquely ergodic, which is typically the case, long trajectories equidistribute. Okay? So what you need, uh, 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 one needs the following. So we need uh, uh, shearing. And shearing, as we did last time, by the explicit formula of a suspension flow evolution, uh, we computed shearing in terms of Birkhoff sums, if you remember. So one needs to show that SR of F prime divided by R tends to infinity. Uh, let me recall you maybe here. Uh, recall notation SR of F is the Birkhoff sum. Okay, so this is my notation for Birkhoff sums of the function along the uh, base transformation. And we prove this, that uh, shearing is described by these Birkhoff sums. And uh, uh, so Birkhoff sums of the derivative, important here there is a derivative. And the derivative has 1 over x type of singularities, which are not integrable. So we are out of the birkhoff ergodic theorem standard range. So what we will prove indeed, that Birkhoff sums grow faster than expected when the there are these type of singularities. And then you also need, this is what we will try to focus on today. And then you also need some kind of uh, distortion bound. So you have some kind of uh, quantity. You also need some estimate on the second derivative. So for example, sorry, if you look at the second derivative Birkhoff sums and take the sup over the inf on each partition interval of the, uh, maybe I should put r of t uh, for j. Uh, this, this is the uh, sec soup of the second derivative versus the first derivative has to go to zero. And for j in pt, uh, uh, and then you also need, uh, maybe I'll finish here, and then you need equidistribution. This is just uh, of the flow. So if I look uh, at a long trajectory of my flow, so if I look at, uh, I don't know, if I look at, uh, you want to prove, uh, if you have a trajectory of my special flow, phi t of x, so this is the special flow, well, the flow, that's OK. And uh, I want to say how much time it spends uh, uh, in the rectangle B, and I average the time spent in B. So this is the usual ergodic theorem. This tends to uh, uh, measure of B, area of B. 
So this is simply three uh, just from actually unique, you will need some uniform quantity, so unique ergodicity of the interval exchange. So I know not everybody works in ergodic theory, so if you don't want to know what ergodicity is, this is a fact. You have equidistribution of trajectories. <coughs> yes? Can you repeat what was the M-E-S-H, M-E-S-H? Mesh. What are you looking at here? Uh, a mesh, a mesh, mesh. Mesh. What is the mesh? Yeah. Uh, this is a partition. A partial partition is just union of these joint intervals, and uh, these intervals are just take the largest diameter. Okay. It's just the size. So these intervals are getting smaller and smaller, and filling more and more of my space. Okay. 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 And, uh, and so. I don't understand when you the, when you write the row b uh, below. Yes. You <coughs> means that t goes to infinity. So, uh, to be honest, I, I was a little bit uh, sloppy. So uh, maybe what I should write is like this. So for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a, a t zero of epsilon such that for every t greater than t zero, eventually uh, this is actually let's put it like this: one minus epsilon the Lebesgue measure of, uh, so it's E, the proportion, uh, the proportion of each interval which uh, uh, does whatever it should do. Okay, and so it's J in T. For every, for every J in PT. So for every epsilon there exists a T0 such that for every J in PT, this proportion is close to the limit. Th that's bad, you're right, I was actually, sl uh, I made it, yeah. Are you happier? Yeah. The ratio goes to whatever it should go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're right, the size is going to zero. So that's, uh, I should, yeah, this is. Say it again. What is RT then uh, on the right? Uh, what is uh, where? R, uh, just below. Right? Ah, RT, it's oh, okay. This is written, uh, maybe let me make some space. RT of X of F prime, double prime of X. Uh, let me write it RT of X. F prime of x. So RT is a way to relate discrete time with continuous time. So RT of x was the number of discrete iterates that the point x undergoes when flowing for time t. So I can write something like uh, the minimum, uh, 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 the max, first maybe the max r greater than zero. I don't, I'm not sure what I defined it last week, but uh, such that uh, sr uh, f prime of x is uh, uh, sr of f of x is less than t something uh, max r let's see max the largest which is less than t so this is the number of iterates that uh, my point undergoes under my suspension flow mm -hmm. okay because here I'm have a, uh, you could write everything with discrete time if you prefer but I, I parameterize the partitions by continuous time so I need to link discrete and continuous time, okay? Okay. Uh, okay, so are you up with me? So this criterion, I hope it's clear. So we want to find uh, small segments with equidistributes. How are we going to do it? Again, let me draw the picture. I'm going to show that each of these uh, small segments, J, when I flow it, will stretch and look like a line. So essentially, I will not tell you anything more about. So, so I, I, I want to convince you with heuristically that if I prove one, two, and three, they give me uh, the possibility of applying the criterion. So I'll give you just a sketch. So essentially. Uh, I claim that uh, uh, sketch, so sketch, sketch that one plus two plus three implies uh, uh, mixing. Is that uh, basically I just say that one plus two imply that phi t of j is close, is asymptotically. 
tends to somehow <laughs> a vertical line, a vertical long line, a vertical, almost vertical uh, So one is giving you the shear. It's giving you that it's stretching. And two is giving you some distortion. So two is giving you that it's stretching and becoming a line, not a parabola. And then uh, uh, three, uh, uh, this implies that, as we said last time, that mixing. Uh, by the by the criterion, uh, well, uh, the mixing uh, reduces to equidistribution. I.e. three. So if these curves become vertical lines, I just need to know how much time each of these trajectories spends in the target B, and this is given by ergodicity. Okay, it's a quick sketch, but it's not the, I don't want to spend more time than this to, to uh, so what I really will try to really prove, and so by, I should say this, uh, this uh, criterion is in some sense quite standard, and it has been used by many people, so starting from uh, uh, Kocherguin, Sinai and Hanin, and uh, Bassam Fayyad for uh, analytic reparatramizations of flows on Torai. Actually, he has nice uh, text uh, with all the details. And uh, by myself, by Davide, by Chaika Wright, by anybody who's proven mixing for these flows. So this is very standard, okay? So what I really want to try to explain is how you get this type of estimates and what do you need on the interval exchange for proving them, okay? So I want to understand basically Birkhoff sums of a function which has one over x singularities and try to prove that there is stretch in the asymmetric case, okay? <coughs> and uh, uh, what is the other side? Sorry, I will go, uh, where do we, maybe we go here. I also want to tell you the opposite. So this is more formalizing a little bit what we did at the, in the last class heuristically, the mixing via shearing. I said at the very end of the Thursday two weeks ago that not only shearing gives you mixing, but for systems with enough rigidity, this is the only way to get mixing. So no shearing, no mixing. And that goes in the other direction. So when we have symmetry, we will prove that there is no shearing, and we want to deduce that there is no mixing. So this is not true in general, but let me then tell you what you need on the base for this to be true. <coughs> so we have a criterion for mixing, and now let me tell you a criterion for absence of mixing, no mixing. And this is also old. Uh, this goes back to Kochergin in the 70s. And maybe I should also say Katok. Because it okay. okay. So I need one preliminary definition. So definition of partial rigidity, one form of partial rigidity. So I said shearing is necessary as long as the base, so the IT is rigid enough. What does rigid enough means? So, so let's say AN, RN, are partial rigidity, partial rigidity sequence, if, so EN are subsets of zero one, EN are sets where the partial rigidity will happen uh, such that 
the back measure of EN is bounded below by a positive constant. <coughs> so these are the sets of partial rigidity. And uh, Rn are the times going to infinity. So these are rigidity, partial rigidity times, rigidity times. Uh, and basically, you want that t to the Rn uh, restricted to the set En converges to identity. <coughs> so if I look at En and uh, at the rigidity time, this set is essentially fixed by my map. And this you can think in infinity norm. Actually, what we will prove is that uh, there is uh, uh, partitions, Pn, partitions converging to trivial partition, mesh going to zero, such that uh, for every f in Pn, uh, if I look at, uh, you can forget this. You can just think of the previous, but precisely, uh, uh, we prove that there are partitions so that when I intersect on my EN and apply T to the RN, this goes back inside F. Uh, this is a way to say that uh, uh, things are moved by little. Okay. So sorry, this is the definition. And here comes the criterion for absence of mixing in special flows. So fifty special flow over T under F. So T does not have to be an IT. It just have to be anything which is partially rigid. So if there exists EN RN as above. If there are partial rigidity sets and times for the base, and there exists a universal constant such that, and now I want to say there is no stretch on EN, and I say this by, I look at uh, RN Birkhoff sums for F, and Rn Birkhoff sums uh, at the point x. Uh, let me write it for every x in and y in En. <coughs> so if I look at two points in En and I look at the Birkhoff sums. Uh, the difference of Birkhoff sums at time Rn, the difference stays bounded uniformly in N. So this is no stretch. Maybe I write in a different color. This is no shearing. This is no shearing. This tells me that two points uh, on this set E are not sheared. The, there's no discrepancy between the two. Okay? If there is no shearing on a partial rigidity set, no mixing. Okay? You can try to prove this as an exercise on special flows and mixing if you want. So what's the idea? So I hope the statement is clear. So the idea is that if I have a set which comes back close and at the same time, at the corresponding time, the Birkhoff sums don't stretch, somehow my set does not have uh, hope to equidistribute. It does not have, sp does that it cannot mix. It stays kind of in a subset of my space. Is that <laughs> it's not a proof, but I want to say the idea is that too much rigidity, rigidity in the base and no stretch forces some sets to self-intersect too much in, in making mixing impossible. 
Okay, so you can try and if you want, or you can Katok or Kocherkin would have a proof. Okay, but again, for uh, the from now on, I think I think I will not explain uh, mixing directly anymore. So again, from now on, I will try to prove uh, this type of estimates of stretching in the asymmetric case. And I will really prove this uh, assumption of the criterion in the absence of mixing case. So I will build for you what are these rigi partial rigidity sets. And I will try to explain, probably we'll go to Thursday morning, but we'll try to pre pre present how you prove these cancellations and no stretching estimates, OK? Are you happy? So from now, we abandon the geometric picture of uh, shearing and mixing. and we uh, focus on estimates on Birkhoff sums. So this is an estimate on the derivative. This will also be an estimate on the derivative. I will prove that the derivative will be less than r uh, uh, times constant on an interval of size 1 over r. So by mean value, we will have uh, uh, bounds. Okay. So they will be all estimates on the derivatives for non-integrable function. And in the symmetric case, we will exploit that these functions, even though they are non-integrable, they have somehow principal value 0. So they are symmetric enough that, uh, OK? <coughs> any question or any? So so I hope you got a feeling so of this shearing in action. So uh, really, it's a good uh, picture to remember. In the parabolic world, in the world of flows with entropy 0, uh, mixing, really, I don't know of any example where mixing does not happen mm, because of, I mean, shearing it seems to be really a key feature for mixing. Okay, So I think it's something good to remember. OK, so what I want to do now is to explain how to study Birkhoff sums over interval exchanges. And uh, to do that, we need to start a new chapter. So we need to talk about uh, renormalization. Or in the concrete, we are going to say something about Rosevich induction. So this is really a key tool to study interval exchanges, which has a long history. So it goes back to Rosie and Vich uh, in the 80s, and it's uh, very much used in Tegmuller dynamics. But uh, I don't want to do a course. This is not a course on Rosie Vich induction. I'm going to tell you only what I need from my perspective uh, from the goal of this course. So there are beautiful lecture notes by Jean-Christophe Yocos, who taught several <laughs> courses in Paris, and by Viana and uh, uh, others. So let me just tell you what is the idea of. Uh, and first of all, this is what is the replacement of uh, continued fractions. So if you like to work with rotations or Hamiltonian systems, you might like to put the Yofantine conditions or rotation numbers through uh, continuous fraction statistics, OK? So when you have an interval exchange, we are going to put the Yofantine conditions on the interval exchange by using this tool, OK? And we will describe typical IETs for uh, the theorems to hold uh, through this. So what is Rosevich induction? What is renormalization? So first, let me do a trivial remark. Say that I have an IT interval exchange map. And I look at a subinterval, J contained in I. I can induce, so TJ, maybe it's a definition, or the remark comes later, TJ from J to J induced map. So this is standard construction in ergodic theory. It's a little bit like the section, but 
Uh, so given a point of in J, what is the induced map? It's like a first return map, just uh, uh, in the same space. So I point in J, will go out under T, and then at some point we'll be back in, in, in J. So I just accelerate my map until I'm back in J. So X goes to T to the RJX of X. So I have to use a power of T, an iterate of T, where RJ of X is the first return time. to j. So this is the minimum r greater than 0 such that tr of x is back in j. Okay. So this is standard. I can induce a map. Remark, so I haven't used the t is an it, but now I will use if t is an it, tj is again an it. Uh, maybe let me add something. If T has uh, D intervals, D continuity intervals, the induced map uh, has at most D plus 2 intervals, exchanged intervals. Kay. So. Um, it's very similar to what we did for suspensions last week. How do you prove this? Well, you look at the discontinuities of t and the endpoints. The plus 2 comes from the endpoints. And you look at the pre-images. You kind of pull back the discontinuities of t. And those will be the first time that they enter j will create the discontinuities of the induced map. Oh, OK, it doesn't. Mm. Uh, it's one of the first properties you can prove for IETs. So, uh, so maybe I can just say pull back to J discontinuities of T. Plus I endpoints. And uh, Rosevich induction gives you a procedure, an algorithm, to choose a sequence of inducing intervals. So we want to induce our IT on smaller and smaller scales. And uh, the algorithm is just uh, uh, a recipe for how to build a sequence of inducing intervals. So maybe I will just say, I will say Rosevich induction. gives a sequence i n sequence of nested intervals so by nested i mean that i n plus 1 is contained in i n shrinking uh, 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 with zero as left endpoint. So I start from I zero, which is I, and the algorithm will give me a sequence I n, I n plus one. It gives me a sequence of intervals shrinking to zero. So smaller and smaller with this as an endpoint. <coughs> Such that t to the n, so t to the n will be my notation for the induced map. Such that t to the n induced map of t to i n. 
So this is a notation. I'm calling t to the n, the induced map. Uh, so if you want t to the n is uh, t, uh, how did I write it? t i n. Okay. So it's a short form for inducing t on i n. And so the intervals are chosen so that the induced map is again i t of d intervals, not d plus 2 or d plus 1. So Rosy uh, defined this algorithm. So he just wanted the, uh, you can kind of do it in the way not to miss any chance. You can decrease your interval and uh, uh, capture all the moments where the induced map has exactly d and not d plus 1 or d plus 2 intervals. And you will get this algorithm. To be honest, it's not so important what the algorithm is, but just to leave it not a mystery. So you choose IN plus 1 to be the following. So if this is IN and this is T to the N. Sorry. Sorry. There will be a last interval of the induced map. And there will be some interval which is moved by the IT to become the last. So what you should do, you should compare the last interval before the exchange with the last interval after the exchange. Look which of the two is shortest and uh, uh, cut that shortest. So what is left will be i n plus 1. So i n plus 1 will be i n minus some j, where j is the shortest between last interval Uh, of Tn before and after exchange. Let me write it like this. I do not want to introduce more notation. So, okay. So I think it's clearer in words. Okay. So uh, this is the algorithm. <coughs> so. Uh, I should have said uh, that you need a condition to guarantee that this algorithm never stops. So there is one case where you don't know what to do, which is when these two intervals have the same lengths. And you want to avoid this. But for example, if you assume that your lengths are irrationally related, you are sure that this will never happen. In general, it's enough to assume the so-called Keen condition on IT, if you know what are IT. And then your algorithm is defined forever. So you never run into this uh, uh, equal equality case. OK? OK, no, not to worry so much. So what is really important for me, just that you, we are inducing the IT. So we are uh, looking at first return maps of the original IT on smaller and smaller intervals. OK? And let me tell you another standard construction, which is important for us. And again, it's another basic construction in ergodic theory, those of uh, Rocklin towers or uh, uh, Rocklin or uh, Kakutani skyscrapers. They are also, maybe we should use Kakutani skyscrapers. So this is, again, something quite standard. So if I have an induced map, I can try to represent the whole space as towers over the induced map. So I, I will, uh, so, so maybe let me write it like this. One can represent T as acting on, let me write it and I will explain, on towers over Tn. 
So it's a way to reconstruct the original transformation from the induced map as follows. So let me write it like this. I need some more notation. Say that I did my induction up to step. Maybe I'll write it smaller. So this is my IN. It's a small interval. And uh, TN is my induced IT on this small interval. And uh, so I will denote I and J. So let I and J for J from 1 to D be exchanged intervals of Tn. So I have the exchanged intervals for Tn. And let R and J. Again, I'm using this uh, capital, this uh, bracket N for the nth. Everything which has to do with the nth step of my induction has a parenthesis N. R and J are uh, B return time of uh, I and J to I N. So again, this is uh, minimum r greater than 0, such that tr of i and j is contained in in. <coughs> so I'll try to have two pictures on my board. One is the picture of the original space. And one is this induced picture. And I have space in between to draw towers. So if you have a small interval exchanged by this IT, so this is somewhere in my, in my sp big space. And it will go around under T a certain number of times before making it back to the small interval. So you should think this small interval travels out of the inducing interval until it comes back. And uh, it's standard to kind of plot the iterates which are out of the small interval as a tower of, uh, over the small interval. So I'm going to plot plot uh, R and J. I'm going to plot R and J. Uh, you can plot them with distance 1. I'm plotting the R and J iterates as uh, floors above. And similarly for any of the others. So any interval will have, uh, sorry, any interval will have his return time. And I will plot as many copies as the return time. So maybe this is, maybe this is longer, I don't know. And maybe this is shorter, I don't know. OK, so I'm plotting towers. So I will write just. Uh, the formula. This is just a graphical representation that I will show you why it's convenient to visualize the dynamics. Uh, so, but just by definition of return time, we have that uh, 0, 1, so this is i, i0. You can write it as union from 1 to d. This will be the d towers of the union. Uh, and now I'm going to write ti of i and j. So each base, I iterate it from 0 to r and j. OK, something like this. So this is a disjoint union. So each of these small intervals travel for time r to the j with these joint copies. And uh, 
then makes it back to i n. If I take the union of all this, ah, oh sorry, maybe minus one. The r n will already self-intersect. Okay, so all of this is what I call a tower. So this is the J's tower. This is what I plot like this. It has base i and j and uh, height uh, r and j. So this union is called the uh, Rocklin tower. And uh, this union of towers is called the Kakutani skyscraper. Okay? And uh, interval exchange transformations are an example of what is called a finite trunk dynamical system. So when you can have this representation with Kakutani towers whose base is shrinking to zero, with finitely many, in this case d, towers at every step, you say that your system has rank d. So an interval exchange has actually rank d at most d. Uh, right, rank at most d by intervals. So you can build it with Kakutani skyscrapers with d towers made by intervals. In general, in this construction, you can have the base could be a measurable set. It doesn't have to be an interval. We are doing it with intervals, OK? So renormalization gives you the sequence of towers. And uh, soon we'll need a break. But I want to finish a little bit more about these towers. And uh, uh, Sorry, so Kakutani towers, OK. Uh, so in this tower in my picture, so again, at this uh, floor, I don't know, the floor k, what I'm drawing here is tk of i, j, n. So these are like a stacked up version of the iterate. Okay. And uh, in this picture, so in this picture, so first of all, these towers, you could plot them here. I can plot them here. So basically what I'm saying that my original interval is partitioned into d colors, one per tower, right? So there are blue, red floors, and there will be some yellow floors. So this is just a statement about partitions, just stating that I can partition my space into uh, floors of towers. But uh, the reason why we plot it as towers is that I can see the dynamics of t in these towers well. So T, how does T act? So T acts on the towers, towers picture, by moving up one floor, until the top. So just by definition, if I take a point in the base, where does it go? It goes straight up, because I'm stacking up the images. Okay? So the dynamics, you can see it as going up the tower. What do you do when you get to the top? This is time return time minus 1. At the next time, I'm back in the base with the induced map. So the top and the bottom are glued by the induced map. So until the top, then use, use Tn back to In. Okay? So that's why we plot it as towers. So the dynamics is moving up. And at the top, I come back to the base using the induced map. It should remind you of what we did with special flows. But we were using continuous time. This is like a discrete time version. For continuous time, we had the Poincaré map, and then we build a special flow. Here we have a discrete inducing, and we build a discrete special flow. This is some sort of discrete special flow. OK? Good. Uh, 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 I want to finish some one definition before the break. and. Um, Yes, the one definition before the break. So you can meditate. If you have never seen it, you can ask me questions. Uh, the last definition I want to give is about uh, matrices that arise from this algorithm. I want to define through this picture the Rosivichko cycle. Uh, okay. So induction produces 
a sequence of matrices that I will call a n uh, and in n sequence of d by d uh, positive non negative integer matrices so matrices with uh, non uh, zero or po positive possibly zero uh, integer entries uh, as follows so i will cheat i will not define uh, mm, exactly the matrices but i will define the product what it is so let me set a notation i will call a capital n the product of a n a1 okay and I will define you the product instead than the single matrices, uh, such that the n uh, is given by, it's uh, just a counting, so a n i j, and I can write it in two's way. So i n i j, I have to do the following. I will first say it, then write it. I will take my interval i and j, and iterate it until it comes back. So until it comes back, you know, I have my original intervals of the original i t. So I have an interval i zero i for for one to d. So I fix one of these uh, intervals of the big i t at the beginning, and I count how many times my small interval enters the i's original interval before coming back. Okay, so let me write. A and I J is the cardinality of visits of uh, I and J to I zero J I. So uh, I and J J is the small interval. I is the original interval. Cardinality of visits of I and J to I J up to return time. Oh, let me write it. So you sum the characteristic function of this interval along the orbit up to the return time. Count how many visits, okay? Uh, is it clear what I mean? Or not? So ask me if you ask me in the break if not. And it can also uh, maybe if we'll finish with this. Uh, so maybe I'll make a remark. Towers. Uh, can be, this is the definition, and towers can be obtained by so-called, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but so-called cutting and stacking. This is an aside, not crucial, so I'll just put it as a side. So if I have the towers, let me draw them as a rectangle, just not to draw all the, if I have the towers at step n, and now in, I induce, say, here, because, say, this is my last interval. So how do I get the next towers? I actually have to cut a piece or a full tower of level n and stack it on top of one of the previous towers. So this kind of comes from the dynamics. So, okay, so... Where do I go above this level? Above this level, I come back here, so I'm actually doing the next uh, tower. So I can stack it because that's where the dynamics will tell me to go. So okay, there is a way to, you think, <laughs> you have these towers, what you do, you chop pieces and stack them up and get thinner and longer towers. So you can also think that thin and long towers are made by uh, 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 floors of the original towers, if you want, or thin and long towers are made by blocks of the original towers. And these matrices are, uh, okay, maybe this is, and these matrices also tell you how many, uh, here it will tell you how many blue floors there are in a long tower, or you could look at intermediate products. So, let's write like this. A, and M 
for uh, n greater than m. This would be a n up to a m. Uh, so a n m i j are pieces, pieces of cardinality of pieces of uh, j tower. Oh, oh, sorry, of i tower of step step. Uh, uh, what is bigger of step? Uh, I need the smaller of step m used to make j tower at step n. Okay, so these uh, entries of these matrices also give you information of how the towers are built up. And now I have five minutes before we resume, and I can tell you uh, the Yofantan condition and some ideas of Birkhoff sum estimates, okay? So now we defined Rosevich induction, and we defined um, this induction procedure and towers and return times, Rocklin towers, which I like. Sorry, can I ask you to discuss later? So, <laughs> yeah, I'm starting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, in reality, so uh, this uh, slow algorithm by Rosy is not the best to use if you want to study uh, some many dynamical properties. So there are various accelerations. So you can skip some steps and go faster in your algorithm. And uh, uh, especially, it's not so nice that these matrices, the, the single matrices, uh, could have lots of zeros. So sometimes you might want to look at larger steps, so go many steps in one, so that your matrices have strictly positive entries and not zeros. This is sometimes called positive acceleration, and it was used by your cause, actually, I think, a lot. Also by Vich originally. Uh, and uh, I want to look at the so-called uh, uh, positive, uh, balanced, balanced, and positive acceleration. This is really a crucial tool for me in the estimates of Birkhoff sums. And it's my favorite acceleration of Rosevich induction. So let me say, say that n is balanced, and actually new balanced for some new constant greater than 1. So if when I look at these towers, uh, I want them to have more or less the same area, more or less the same uh, basis length, and more or less the same heights. So if nu, this is an induction time, say nu, let me write it better, say that an induction time nu is nu balanced, if uh, when I look at the return times, r and i, r and j, the ratios are bounded above and below by 1 over nu nu. So they are comparable up to nu for every ij uh, in 1t. And uh, so this is height balance, or return times balance. So the towers have roughly the same height, and they have roughly the same width. So and uh, uh, let me write uh, let me write i and j for uh, maybe let me write actually lambda and i for the Lebesgue length so i and i. So I'm using lambda, it's standard notation for the lengths. And I want that the lengths, L and I, I divided L and J, are bounded above and below by you. Okay? So roughly same heights, half roughly same width. Okay? And uh, I want to look at balanced. Uh, 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 So it's a fact from that I cannot prove for you, but it comes from ergodicity of this renormalization map that for almost every IT, there will be 
infinitely many times which are balanced for any new. So it's essentially just uh, Poincare recurrence or ergodicity. And uh, so let me, uh, I will only look at IETs for which there are infinitely many balanced times. And I will just speed up my algorithm. So I don't want, I want to go from one balance time, jump directly to the next balance time, okay? And uh, I want to avoid having sub-indices. So from now on, I will forget about the induction that I defined and use n as an index for positive, for balanced times only, so right? So notation, so from now on, so, T such that there exist uh, infinitely many balance n. You can fix a uh, new, new, you, uh, okay. Uh, and then you, I will write the n will be the nth balanced, balanced induction time. Okay, so Tn, uh, 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 In to In. So I'm just renaming by N, is it clear? I'm just changing the notation and calling directly N only the balanced one. And we also, uh, this is actually a little technical thing. I also want to assume that uh, a, uh, all the matrices, so this is the matrix to go from step N to step N plus one, they are strictly positive. So I could be balanced and immediately after uh, balanced again, I want to kind of space this balance time enough so that the matrices from one to the next are positive. I can do that just by waiting some number of steps. Uh, uh, okay, so now basically I changed the induction algorithm and I'm using this positive balanced acceleration. When from one step to the next, I uh, go from balanced picture to balanced picture. And this positivity, so sorry, this positivity means that a n i j is greater than zero for every i j. This positivity tells me that when I have my towers at step n, I have to cut them and stack them to get them at step n plus one. And all towers are cut and all towers are stuck to each other. So I do enough of these basic steps so that every i tower got stuck to every j tower. Okay, that's the um, dynamical meaning. So these are my favorite uh, times to impose conditions on uh, the IT. And just as an aside, you might like to, uh, uh, maybe I should have said that early. So if you do for, let me, let me do another remark. So if you do uh, d is equal to two, so if you do rotations, uh, the matrices that you get, uh, okay, maybe I'm lying a little bit. Uh, let me not do it. So, okay, uh, uh, okay. At some point in your product, you will see matrices which look like this or, or uh, uh, this. And where a n are the continued fraction entries, if you know continued fractions. Huh? This is an aside of uh, alpha uh, for maybe not the first, but for from the second one. So I want to say that uh, these matrices, you should think of them as a way of generalizing continued fraction. So if you do the algorithm for dimension two, it will produce you two by two matrices whose entries are related to continued fraction. And naively, many people try to mimic, uh, you should try to mimic continued fraction properties through these matrices. So condition, the often conditions will be conditions on the growth of these matrices. But uh, uh, you should really not do it, for do it using Rosevich induction. You should use an acceleration. And uh, the positive acceleration balance is even better, but positive acceleration will be the minimum you need to do to have something meaningful. So somehow I leave this as a vague comment, but uh, it's really crucial, so okay. 
Uh, what irrational here? I'm just. Uh, what do you want here? If alpha is irrational, I will be able to do Rosevich induction forever. It will produce me. So the slow Rosevich induction will produce matrices of the form something like this: one one zero one, a certain number of time, actually a zero times, and then it will produce one zero one one, uh, a one times. And so on. This is the slow induction. Sorry, are you asking? This uh, who asked me the question? Yes, uh, sorry. <laughs> That's what were you asking? I was asking what are those irrational numbers? That ah, if any rational will work because what you will have this <laughs> type of matrices, and once you produce ah, uh, uh, no, you have to be a little careful. Um, you don't want uh, uh, basically you don't want things which escape to infinity, so you don't want uh, your entries to be. Uh, diverging, yes. Uh, let me think, yes. Mm -hmm. Let me think. Or every, uh, um, uh, yeah, I think you don't want them to diverge because uh, the positive matrices will be this uh, will have this product of two consecutive entries of the continued fraction. So I, I have to think. So, but uh, okay, let's discuss it later. But okay, so now. Uh, Good. Now, new step. Uh, special Birkhoff sums. OK, so I can use this induction to study uh, behavior of Birkhoff sums. This is what I want to do next. And uh, the idea is that the positive times of the acceleration, uh, of balance times of the acceleration, will give me some particularly good Birkhoff sums that I can study quantitatively and which I will use as building blocks to study Birkhoff sums. Uh, okay, so let me say, now I give myself a function which will be, for example, my derivative of the roof function, but any function. And uh, to find all my i0, And I claim that I also have a sequence of induced Birkhoff sums or induced functions. So, so the algorithm produces uh, a sequence of functions which I will denote Sn of f. So B, uh, this will be functions from In to R, induced functions, you should think of them. And uh, be aware that uh, uh, NB SN is not SN. So this was the Birkhoff sum. This will be the special Birkhoff sum. It will be some. And uh, these are called uh, special Birkhoff sums. I will define them in a second. So I claim that given my function, I have a sequence of functions. I'm calling them Sn of f. I think it's the notation of Marvin Musayo cause originally, but uh, defined by the following. So it's defined on this small interval. It's only defined on this small interval. And I will tell you what happens if x is in the j subinterval. If x is i and j, this will be the sum of f. Basically, what you want to do is sum your function along up to the return time. So I will take my point x and look at the Birkhoff sum from 0 up to the return time, minus 1. So this small interval has a return time. And I sum my function up to the return time. Okay. So this, if you want, is uh, S, R, and J of F of X. Right? It's a, the special Birkhoff sum. It's a special Birkhoff sum. <laughs> it's a Birkhoff sum up to the return time. And this is, uh, I will let me write it, is the sum along the tower. So the plot would be uh, 
I have a point x in the J tower. And the orbit of this point is moving up, 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 up to the return time. I just sum the values of my function along the tower. Okay, It's the sum along the J tower at that point. And OK. So special Birkhoff sums, you should think of them as your basic building blocks. So, so we want to estimate Birkhoff sums for a function with certain singularities. But this is always done uh, even if you want to estimate Birkhoff sum for piecewise constant function, for smooth function. It was done by uh, everybody. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. With this notation, I guess, again, it's in Marvin Musayo cause. OK, so general uh, strategy, strategy. So if you want to estimate, let me change, not, let me not call it f, but uh, let me call it uh, g, because g will be the derivative of f for us in a second. So if I want to estimate Birkhoff sums of a function g, you want to do two things. Step one, I want to estimate special Birkhoff sums of g. And let me stress, I'm assuming it implicitly in my notation, but let me stress it for n balanced. It's important for me that it's balanced, OK? So this uh, Birkhoff sums, when the tower are balanced, will be very good because there will be good equidistribution estimates. So balanced towers will be well spaced in 0, 1. So these Birkhoff sums will have good estimates. And the step two, this is very broad outline. Step two, it's uh, decompose a general SNG of x into special Birkhoff sums. And interpolate the estimates you had. Okay. This is really important philosophy. So I want to convince you that special Birkhoff sums will be good for us to estimate. And then we will need to use them as building blocks uh, to estimate other sums. So what do you need here? So if I want to hope to interpolate between two special Birkhoff sums, I need the special Birkhoff sums happen frequently enough. So I ca if, I, if it takes me a long time to go from one balance time to the next balance time, I will have less hope to interpolate, right? This is where the Jofantine conditions come into play. What I need, I need Jofantine conditions, and I'll tell you what I mean. Jofantine conditions on the IT, uh, which means IE. Uh, good frequency, frequency of occurrence of balance times. I.e., I will have to estimate on the gross of these matrices. Okay, so. If this norm of this matrix is not too large, it means that it doesn't take me too many steps to go from balance to balance. And uh, this norm, you can take any norm like the sum of the entries. Okay, I will give you a condition in a second for mixing. Okay, so this is important strategy. And let me tell you in action how this strategy works for mixing. So mixing. Missing case. So this is the 
f belonging to asymmetric log. Okay, so we want to do the mixing. So So I will tell you now the Diophantine condition. Uh, uh, maybe I will tell you this proposition. Maybe oh, I don't know if it's a definition or. Uh, okay, let me just write it without anything. So for almost every IT, and we defined last week, almost every IT means almost every length for irreducible combinatorics. For almost every IT. Uh, um, Balanced acceleration uh, for every, sorry, uh, maybe I should put it first. So sorry. For every one less than gamma less than two. This is technical, it will come up later. So take a gamma from one to two, the balanced accele acceleration is such that uh, the norm of AM. So this again are the matrices in this process from n to n plus 1 balanced uh, times and they are positive. These are less than constant n to the gamma. So these entries, these matrices, uh, don't grow too fast. They grow sub-polynomially. Okay? So maybe it looks a little bit out of the blue. So who likes continued fractions here? Anybody likes continued fraction? Yes, good. OK, so compare with the following statement. Uh, for almost every rotation number, uh, if we write alpha as 1 over a0 plus 1 over a1 dot, 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 dot in continued fraction, uh, there exists a c such that a n is greater, less than c, n to the gamma. A gamma, as before, is between 1 and 2. So this is true statement about uh, rotations. And it's the analogous of my statement for, this is actually, uh, this is actually the condition which was used by Sinai and Hanin in their paper from mixing. Uh, and maybe let me give you a name. This condition, I'm going to call it MDC. So this will be uh, the mixing diophantine condition. So this is a full measure condition which I will use for mixing. Okay. So it's telling me that these balanced times, in some sense, are quite frequent. So uh, the distance between them grows uh, sub, uh, this norm grows sub polynomially. OK, so do you want to know how to prove this statement? For continued fraction, I will give you as an exercise, and I will give you a hint. So the exercise is prove this statement, uh, prove it. And let me tell you hint, two hints or two-step hint. So first, you may want to show that if I look at, so let uh, a zero of alpha be integer part of one over alpha, right? The first entry. So hint, you want to prove that if I take for every epsilon greater than zero, if I take a zero to the alpha one minus epsilon, and I integrate it in 0, 1 with respect to the Gauss measure, this is finite. So I, I can give this to the exercise in the ergodic theory course to when I teach ergodic theory to my students. So you can actually prove if I don't put epsilon, this is infinite. The expectation of the entries are infinite. If I put the log, this is also easy to prove that it's true. But you can put the power 1 minus epsilon. So this you can just check it's an integral to compute with the Gauss measure. So, and then the other ingredient that you need is Borel-Cantelli. And this is a very good exercise. Try to do it. So first prove this, and then use this plus Borel-Cantelli to prove that statement. 
okay? And this is essentially the same plot line that you have to follow to prove that that Diophantine condition has full measure. You want, it comes from a Borel-Cantelli argument, but uh, the input for the Borel-Cantelli is not as easy as that. So what do you need to know? So maybe uh, a full measure of mixing the Diophantine condition uses a uh, 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 key result by Marmi, uh, sorry, Avila Guazelio cause. Uh, they have, a, I think, a unique joint paper on exponential mixing for the Teichmuller flow. And the main technical thing, which is uh, at the heart of the whole paper, is an estimate on Rosevich induction, which essentially tell you that, uh, let me write it like this. The integral on the space of IT of this uh, norm of one positive balanced entry uh, with respect to the invariant measure uh, on the space of ITs, let me not say, it's uh, finite. Okay, so it's something very similar. You will recognize the similarity. But this is an integral you can compute. This is a deep result, which is the heart of that paper, and the whole the technical paper of Avila Guazelio cause. But if you believe this, you can do your exercise and prove that mixing has full measure, mixing condition. Okay. Good. Uh, special Birkhoff. Uh, let me. We are following this plot. So I told you the Diophantine condition we need. Now I want to tell you the estimates on special Birkhoff sums and interpolation and try to say, to give a hint of what's behind them. Uh, okay. So now I will assume that my IT satisfy the mixing Diophantine condition. T satisfies mixing the often time condition. Okay? So these positive times are such that balanced times are such that the entries don't grow too fast. And take, let me lie and do a toy model. So we are interested in an asymmetric log, but let me just do. Uh, log x. Let me just do one, st one, st one single singularity and consider uh, g is equal to 1 over x. So this is what I need to study the derivative, right? My, sorry, absolute value maybe. Maybe there is a minus, but I will do it without the minus, okay? So this is maybe minus the derivative, right? Uh, if you want to read the real derivative with more singularities, you should read David's paper in the general case. But for today, I'll stick to the one singularity case because it has all the ideas needed. And uh, I will tell you step one and step two, what they become in this situation. So under the standing assumption, right? I'm assuming the MDC. So proposition one, this is step one. Um, uh, let me stress that n is balanced, even it's automatic in my notation. And uh, I want to study a special Birkhoff sum. So uh, take x in the base of an interval and take r, which is the, the return time. So how did I call them? With r or with, ah oh yes, with r. Uh, 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 okay, fine, that's okay. So I take exactly my sum along a balanced tower. And uh, so I claim that, uh, uh, how do I write it? So for every epsilon, there exists an N0, N0 of epsilon such that for every n greater than n0, 
So I want to estimate my Birkhoff sum S R G of X. Right? This is my special Birkhoff sum. This is also G, sorry, S and G of X. Right? This is my special Birkhoff sum. I go up to the height of a tower. And I claim uh, that I have to do the following. I need to remove the closest visit. So x could be, in principle, arbitrarily close to 0. And if x is very close to 0, my Birkhoff sum will be huge. And I have no hope to control it. So there are many cases in ergodic theory where you cannot study ergodic sums, but you can study trimmed ergodic sum. So you have to remove the largest term, and then you can say something meaningful. This is one of these cases. I cannot say anything on the whole Birkhoff sum. I need to remove the largest term, which in this case is 1 over x. Because x could be screw up whichever estimate I try to write. But if I remove x, anything else grow like uh, r log r. So it grows faster than r. Okay. So everything else grows faster than uh, r. It grows like r log r. And uh, um, okay, so this is a special time. I will try to say something about it. Uh, but then let me tell you the step two. Uh, step two will be interpolation. So SR of F. Uh, so sorry. So there exists a sequence of bad sets, uh, Bn contained in 0, 1 such that, uh, OK, again, it's a little bit annoying if I write it precisely. So for every epsilon, there exists uh, n0 of epsilon, such that for every n greater than n0, uh, uh, sorry. Um, so I want to interpolate. Uh, if we write uh, something like Rn for, uh, uh, okay, like Rn for the max or the mean. Uh, so I have a sequence of special times, R and J, of re special return times. And uh, I just pick one of them, say the max. So for every R and X, such that. OK. So I want to say if my uh, r is in between rn and rn plus 1, if I am, if my time is in between two good times, or the size of two good times, I need to throw some set of bn. So if I am in between two good times, I need to exclude some set of Bn. And maybe I should have said here that the back measure of the bad set goes to 0. So I need, there are some small points which I need to throw away, which are related to these closest visits. But uh, in between two balance times, if I'm out of this set, if I'm out of this set, then I have a nice estimate. So SRG. Uh, is less than uh, 1 plus epsilon r log r and 1 minus epsilon r log r. OK, so out of some small measure set, I have a control of type r log r. And this, will, this depends on interpolation on the previous one. And uh, uh, because I had a discussion last week with, uh, where are you? Uh, yeah, with you. So actually, an unfortunate uh, fact 
is that uh, the sum of the Lebesgue measures of these sets is actually infinite. So I cannot do a Borel-Cantelli argument for which I throw something at the beginning which is true for every n. I need to throw something different for every n. And uh, if I can, last day I want to say something about Rotman properties, some refinements, and you will see that <laughs> this is annoying part. So you would like this series to converge. So if you want to have better estimates, you need to work around it. So but this is sufficient for mixing. Because for mixing, you want to prove that every, most of your spaces stretch for every large n. So for every large n, I'm allowed to draw a small measure and prove that Birkhoff sums grow and stretch on most of the space. And the set that I draw for every n, the set which is not mixed for a given time, will change with time. Okay, so there is a bad set which doesn't mix but is going to zero in measure. Great. So these are concrete estimates. This is the real Diophant time condition, and these are the estimates. Uh, I'm left with little time, but I would like to say a few words on, uh, I would like to finish the asymmetric case uh, today, because then I would like to do the symmetric, which is quite different, and uh, uh, some new developments and later results on Thursday. So I have a little bit of sketch of these proofs. So maybe I want to say uh, sketch for proposition one. So what is really, what is really, uh, we are looking at this log. So let me lie and imagine that my points are the most, the best equidistributed they can be. What is the best equidistributed sequence? An arithmetic progression of step one over r. So I want to explain you where the log comes from. So say x up to tr minus 1 of x is equispaced. Okay? Then somehow, so the closest point is of order 1 over r, will be 1 over r actually. The closest point will be 1 over r. Uh, the closest point gives a contribution. OK, closest point is 1 over r. And uh, what, what I will want to do, I will want to say that if I look at 1 over r times the sum of uh, g, oh, sorry, g is 1 over x. The log. Uh, uh, of g of ti of x. If I look at my Birkhoff sum and divide by r, what I want to say that I see a Riemannian sum for the function 1 over x. I can use it to compute the integral of 1 over x. This is a meta philosophy. Uh, this would be actually, I want to approximate it with uh, the Riemannian sum for uh, uh, 1 over x in the x. This is like spacing times value of the function. So it's a Riemann sum. So this is like a Riemannian sum. Riemann sum, maybe. So what's the integral of 1 over x from 1 over r to 1? Log r. Right? So this is where the log r comes from. And the r log r, because here I divide it by r. So ideally, I want to say that. Uh, my Birkhoff sum is close to r log r. This is the heuristic that I want to explain. And uh, <coughs> I want to say balanced times, balanced times are good. What are they good for? Are good for uniform distribution. So if you have balanced times, you can control very well how points are spaced in your, in your space. <coughs> so and let me give you a concrete example. Lemma. For example, say that I look at a uh, n minus n. So I take uh, 
uh, say that I take some uh, entry of my matrix. I say I take. Sorry, this is written badly. So I take the matrix between n minus n and n. So I am at step n, and I go finitely many, n will be a finite number. I will go uh, some number of step back. So what do you expect this to be? Uh, so I say that I'm looking at, uh, if you can prove that this is what you would like it to be. So I'm looking at the Birkhoff sum of lengths, uh, sorry, R is R and J, right? What is it written? Uh, R is R and J. So R and J times the lengths of N minus N I. This is what you would expect this number of visits to be. So I'm looking at an orbit of that length and seeing how many times it visits an orbit, a, an interval of this size. And the claim is that this entry, if you have a fixed number of positive balanced acceleration times, this is what it should be plus an error which is exponentially small in the number of terms, uniformly in n. So, uh, Somehow, uh, I feel I'm a little bit lying, but let me write one word here. Do you know how to prove Perron Frobenius theorem? So, if you have positive matrices, they contract the simplex in, uh, in space. So, if you have positive balanced matrices, so if the, your matrices have norm bounded above by a fixed constant, they contract uniformly the simplex. And really, by po doing just Perron Frobenius argument, you can prove that essentially, when I go finitely many steps in the past of my induction, my points have to distribute well in partitions of the past because of this Perron Frobenius. This is where balance is useful. Balance gives you a quantitative estimate on equidistribution. Uh. I feel I'm rushing too much, so I don't know if I, uh, but I really think it would be horrible to start from here next time. So allow me to run five minutes maybe over time because uh, I'm happy to explain more details for people for which I'm mm, doing too fast. I'm happy for everybody to have an, a feeling of what is happening, but I don't want to interrupt in the middle. So. I will want to start with something disconnected. Or <laughs> to, uh, I start from zero on Thursday and not from the middle. OK, so let me, philosophy. So special times, why are they good? At special times, um, I have uh, good equidistribution estimates of my, on my orbit. Uh, so what does this uh, uh, estimate mean? So I'm looking at an orbit for induction time n, long tower. And uh, if I look at uh, time uh, n minus n of my induction, I see a partition into f larger kind of, uh, uh, large but not too large, some larger intervals. And in these larger intervals, I see the expected number of visits of my orbit. So if I go a little bit on larger steps, my points are well distributed. Using this, you can make precise this heuristic. So you can really approximate uh, your orbit, remove the first point, which is out of control, be careful in the beginning, which is a little delicate, but as you look at uh, steps of some previous partition, you have good amount of point, and you can really approximate your sum with the Riemannian sum. You can say you can kind of count how many visits there are in these intervals and replace all of them with the mean value of the, of the integral. So you really just do a Riemannian approximation using uniform distribution. That's as much as I want to tell you. If you want the details, you can read. In this case, it's uh, my paper on mixing, I think all the details in the general case, it's David's paper, but uh, really I want the idea is that balance times are good because they give you concrete equidistribution, equispacing of your points in the orbit, and the log comes from this integral. Okay, so that's how the idea. 
so the last five minutes are on uh, proposition two uh, sketch. And I want to give you just a sense of where are the bad sets coming from? What are these bad sets and how you decompose? Uh, proof position to sketch. So I, I want to study S R of G of X, right? So, uh, so this is not a, a, a special sum. I need to decompose it into special sums. So what I can do is to find uh, let r n, sorry, no, is this cosy? No, let n r, n r such that, uh, say, the minimum uh, largest, largest n such that minimum of h n uh, j is greater than r, h n, okay. So I want to kind of see my, uh, sorry, uh, I want to see, I want to basically, okay, maybe, I, maybe if I start writing too much, I think I, I will get uh, stuck in the notation and you will not get anything. So let me just do an heuristic picture. I plot R. So this is like a picture of my orbit of length R. So what do you want to do? You want to find, the composite into special Birkhoff sums. So, so what you want to do is essentially to find uh, the largest size of, but for example, from here to here, it could be the time in the, uh, uh, find the largest height of a tower that I can fully fit inside my orbit. So I want to find, at some point, so my point, my orbit may cross many towers of all steps of induction. I find the largest step of induction so that I can fit <laughs> a full tower inside, okay? So maybe from here, maybe the picture would be, uh, uh, but maybe actually, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Let me do it horizontally, some more space. So this is, uh, this is a timeline from zero to R. And it's a timeline of my orbit. And my orbit crosses several towers. But say that here I enter the base of some tower, which goes until, I don't know, which goes until here. Here, I, these are balanced towers until here. But somehow, the maybe the next one is out. But uh, uh, say they are all inside. I cannot fit fully a balanced towers of the larger scale. Right? <coughs> so this part is a special Birkhoff sum. This part is a special Birkhoff sum. I'm left with a reminder. And in the reminder, I'm going to put Birkhoff sums of, of lower, uh, of the previous balance times. And same I will do here. Maybe here I can put. So you can kind of decompose uh, each reminder into a certain number of Birkhoff sums of the previous scale. It, it's again a quite standard uh, procedure, but in number theory, people would say that I'm doing something called Ostrowski expansion of a number. So I don't know if you've ever seen in number theory, you can write an N as uh, BK QK from K from zero to some KN minus one where bk are less than ak, the entries of the continued fraction. You can decompose an integer uh, into denominators. And here, similarly, it's like a dynamical Ostrowski. I, call, I would call it a dynamical Ostrowski. So you can write something like this. Maybe I will write something after all. My Birkhoff sum. I decompose it into special Birkhoff sums of different levels from N0 to NR. NR is the largest I can fit. And for each of them, there's a bunch of each level. There are from 0 to, let's call them BN. 
And here I will put special Birkhoff sum of level n of g for some point xi. Where so I'm writing into different orders of the induction and uh, some number of Birkhoff sums. So, uh, so what should I write here? So where Bn will be less than the norm of these matrices and Xi will belong to In. So these are special Birkhoff sums of level N. Of each order there are as most the special Birkhoff sum of each order, there are as most as the entry of the matrix, and so on. And essentially, what you want to do is just uh, compose the, pre the proposition one. For each, you have a good estimate. Where is the danger? The danger, the danger, danger, danger are closest point. closest points of each. So the closest point, which in my picture will be the first point of each, could be could screw up your estimate. So the main terms R log R of each will combine to the main term R log R, but the closest point can be dangerous. And with the diophantine condition, it turns out that the closest point of the past are not so dangerous, but the really dangerous one are the, the worst, so the worst are the closest point of level, the last level, or level NR. So the, the it could really somehow happen that there is not only one closest point, but there are many other points extremely close, very close. This is somehow like a resonant term. So this is what is like a resonance. This is what you have when you have a rotation and kind of maybe a Liouville time, and then you have some many closest points together. So this comes somehow it's unavoidable, and that's where you need to throw this bad set. So this bad set has to do with accumulation of many closest visits at the largest. And I think I don't want to go into more details than this because I already was very technical, but I hope I got you a glimpse at least of uh, how you can use Rosevich induction to estimate Birkhoff sums, and just a little bit of the flavor of uh, what are the Diophantine conditions and what are the tools. So you have this very precise algorithm. You have rich information thanks to the work of many others like uh, Avila Guzelio Cos on this al the growth of the matrices in this algorithm. And you can use these partitions and this algorithm to have very detailed information on equidistribution of orbits and uh, uh, use them to estimate your Birkhoff sums, comparing them with Riemannian sums or being careful to... So just a little bit of flavor. I hope I can got you some, some ideas. But uh, uh, OK, so it was a dense lecture because we went from Rosevich to... So, so I'll try. It's a quite different mechanism for absence of this. So what I want to show you Thursday, something very basi basic, well, classical, why interval exchanges are not mixing. So I want to show you partial rigidity sets in the towers. So this is some classical result by Katok, essentially. So inside the towers that we built today, I will show you where are the partial rigidity sets. And this, this explains why interval exchanges are not uh, mixing. And then I will try to explain you what happens in the symmetric case. I will give you some ideas of the cancellation phenomena in the symmetric case. So that we finish our mixing and absence of mixing. And then I hope I will be left with an hour to kind of give you a little bit of more recent results. So really what is happening in the last few years, there have been a lot of new results on finer ergodic properties. So I want to state some of this latest development and try to give you the key kind of ingredients. So what do they really become, even this was already technical, but somehow you want to know even finer information on these Birkhoff sums give you uh, many more interesting results on ergodic properties. So I'll try to connect uh, what is happening today with what I try to explain in the first lectures. Okay, so I will give you a glimpse of the new advances. Okay, sorry, I hope you <laughs> got enough out of it. Thanks, yeah. yeah.